Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on men's, mental health and well-being. We would like to welcome, I think, roughly 200 people we have online at the moment, uh, and many more who I'm sure will be watching the recorded version of this when it's made available. MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. I'm in Wurundjeri country in the Kulin Nation, and we wish to pay our respects to the elders, past, present and future, for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So Steve Trumbull's my name and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by training, but my current role is as Professor and Head of Medical Education at the Melbourne Medical School here in Melbourne. Uh, I must say I am really excited about the panel that we've assembled for you this evening. It's the first time I've done one of these webinars with uh, people who are so deeply involved in the topic. And I'm really pleased to uh, welcome and introduce uh, our first panel member, who's Warren Davies, uh, who has lived experience of the topic we're talking about tonight. Now, Warren, I'm intrigued. I've seen you referred to as the unbreakable farmer. Can you tell us just a little bit about how you came to become a public speaker in this area of men's mental health? Good evening, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, basically through my own journey and my own experience um, as a dairy farmer in Northern Victoria, um, my challenges with mental health and also um, uh, with adversity, like uh, through um, floods and droughts and also um, the challenges of a family breakup on the farm um, all added to my experience that I now um, share as the unbreakable farmer, as a, as a speaker and a mental health advocate. Well, fabulous. We're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say about the case tonight and in conversation with the rest of our panel as a bit of a connection, I guess, between people in your own situation and the mental health professionals we have um, on the panel tonight. We have Mary O'Brien, who's a mental health advocate. Now, Mary, you and your organisation, are you bogged, mate? Us mental health professionals, I guess, are used to using various um, measures of uh, mental distress, stress, anxiety, those sorts of things. I need to ask you about the shitometer or shitometer. I'm not sure which way you pronounce it. Uh, that's a fascinating concept I've not come across before. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, good evening, Steve. Well, I guess the, the shitometer is um, using the the comparison to a tachometer on a machine and that we can't run a machine in the red. It's it's not good for the machine and it's not good for us to, to run in, in the red either. So the reality is that we can't sort of stay back in, in the green zone, that that's not life, that's not reality, that there are times we have to go into the red. So it's it's just looking at the way we handle stress and things in our lives, a bit like the revs on a machine. Great. Look, that makes just so much sense. And uh, I think David Walker, our next um, panellist, who's a GP in Longreach, David, I can only imagine that mental health care plans would be a lot easier for us to do if we had a useful measure like the shitometer rather than the K10. But anyway, I I've got to ask where you've been. And Queensland's obviously had quite a different experience with the pandemic and um, it continues to have its issues around Brisbane. But uh, have you noticed a change in the men who've been coming into your clinic in Longreach over the past 12 months? Yeah, it's a really good question, um, Stephen. Look, thanks for having me here tonight and welcome, everybody. Um, uh, look, I always find it hard to make generalisations. To be honest, I think um, I think I have seen more men um, during this period, but it's probably in keeping with the fact that I've seen more people overall. I think many GPs have given the story that we're all um, we're all very busy, and there's a lot of people I think reflecting on their their health, reflecting on how this pandemic um, affects them. I think here in Longreach, and again, difficult to totally generalise, but a lot of people um, are almost you know the pandemic still feels like a long way away until today, of course, when we're all wearing masks even out here. Um, so so hard to generalise, but certainly I think definitely seeing more men. How that um, how that reflects the pandemic per se, I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, it's been a it's been a challenging year for sure. Absolutely. Well, it was great to have your input tonight. And our final panelist to welcome is Dr. Tim Driscoll. Now, Tim, you're a clinical psychologist and part of the um, 
uh, the Royal Flying Doctors Services Outback Mental Health Team. Can you tell us a little bit about what that um, mental health team actually does? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, under that umbrella, we've got um, a few different services. Uh, so one, we've got a driving services that sort of uh, looks at northwest Queensland, central west Queensland and southwest Queensland generally. Uh, and then we've got um, the remote health service, which really looks at uh, putting mental health clinicians on the plane with the doctors and nurses out of Charleville and, and Mount Isa. Uh, so going to those smaller communities that don't have access to a, a GP uh, of them flying in. Um, and a lot of the, the other focus that we have is uh, mental health promotion um, and providing education, things like mental health first aid is an example of that. So uh, really our area is just Western Queensland generally. Massive area to cover, obviously, and a whole lot of issues to deal with there. I hope we've wet your whistle, everybody, or wet your appetite, I should say, not wetting your whistle, wetting your appetite uh, it, with... Um, what the panel has to offer this evening. Before we get there, though, there's just a couple of things to cover off. I'm noticing in the chat that a few people are, uh, seem to be having some problems with their audio. So uh, if you are having problems, there's a number to call, um, 1-800-209-031. Uh, but also there's technical support available if you click on the information icon in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, and under links, you click on webcast support, um, and hopefully that will take you to where you can get some help if there are problems. Look out, Kim from KSP Counselling has live sound now, so that's great. And if we're reaching Narelle on um, Maclay Island, I think we're probably doing okay. So that's good news. We're off, off and away. Uh, if the webcast does browse, um, or oh, sorry, does stop at any time, please refresh your browser. And uh, if the whole thing falls apart, um, it is being recorded, so hopefully you'll catch up with it at, at some stage, but uh, things should go well from here, so that's great. Now, this is a platform that uh, I haven't used personally before, so uh, hopefully I'll navigate it okay. There are various ways you can interact with us. Obviously, we want this to be an interactive session. You want to have your questions coming in, uh, your chat uh, with each other. Please make sure you keep on topic within the chat because um, it's a good way to uh, feed things to the panellists in real time as well as the questions coming in more formally. I see your questions come in from Heather asking, has the webinar started? So yes, is the answer to that question. That's the easiest one we'll have tonight, I'm sure. Um, so uh, um, please do put your questions in. You do that by clicking on the speech bubble icon in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, the single speech bubble icon, you click on that to put a question on our question page that we can respond to. You can chat, as I've mentioned, with the other um, participants, and you can do that by clicking on the two speech bubbles, which are located at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, please don't put your technical queries there. You might get a lot of useful feedback from your peers, but uh, it won't be as useful as clicking on the I information symbol to get uh, help there. And... Um, yeah, I just noticed that people are still having some issues, but hopefully you'll find your way onto the sound uh, there. Uh, there are various other things you can do to change your view to slide only or video only. I don't think I should run through those because it's probably complex enough as it is. And there's a slide up there that should, tells you how to do that if you want to change your view. Anyway, that's enough for now. What we're going to do is get into the meat of tonight's session. Uh, we've had a case that's been circulated, circulated, that hopefully you will have had a chance to read about Charlie and the issues confronting him on his property. What we want to do tonight in terms of the learning outcomes you can see displayed there, one is to identify the associations, comorbidities and patterns of treatment seeking behaviour of men who are experiencing difficulty with their mental health and wellbeing. We're going to talk about some tips and strategies. It's probably why most people are here for providing care to men who seek um, uh, help or assistance with their mental health and well-being. And finally, which is always very important for this particular health professional network, we'll talk about the importance of collaboration and appropriate referrals when supporting men's mental health and well-being. But making the point 
right from the off here, collaboration is not only with other mental health professionals who have a, a formal training in this, uh, we will be um, getting a lot of uh, good information and tips from Warren and Mary tonight as well, who I hope will finish up tonight agreeing. Um, people like that are just so important in assisting men to take that first step. But let's talk about that now, the case of Charlie, and you will have had an opportunity to read it. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Classic 59-year-old man, nothing wrong with that, who's attended his GP clinic after falling off his horse. He's got a physical problem that's finally dragged him into the doctor. But the reality is there are lots of things going on in his life that are impacting on his mental health and well-being. So we'll go to Warren's presentation now. And Warren, this case of Charlie must be a very familiar situation that you've come across before. What are some of the issues that are weighing heavily on Warren as he goes along to the doctor with his um, uh, sore wrist? Yeah, thanks, um, Steve. Uh, it's, yes, it is. It's, a, it's something that um, I've encountered a fair bit uh, in my travels around Australia, presenting in um, rural communities um, and, and particularly in drought communities. Um, Charlie is, um, you know, challenged with... A number of things as he sits in that in that um, that doctor's clinic. Um, one of the things that would be weighing heavily on him is um, is the drought um, um, and the impacts of that. And one of the the biggest impacts um, that I see um, through my own experience and also through the um, the men that I talk with is you know that that loss of control with the drought. Um, one of the, the things that, you know, that you feel that you're, um, you're up against it and you can't control what's happening. You can't um, control the weather and, and you're at its, at its mercy and, and that's having a major impact, particularly as, as um, someone who's dealing with, with livestock and, um, you know, the, the challenges around feeding that, life, like that livestock and, and also caring for his family. That drought has, you know, financial impacts. Um, you know, you're in, farming's a business, and you're in business to to make money and to to support your family. And and, and once the drought takes hold, um, in Charlie's case, it starts to to create a uh, you know a snowball effect of other issues. And 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 all these issues, you know, whether they come out in that first conversation or not, are all weighing heavily on him. Um, particularly uh, the relationships, um, the breakdown of relationships with his with his wife and he, and and you know and the disassociation with his kids um, would be weighing heavily on him because he's obviously a family man um, and with the with the um, the impacts of you know his of the drought and the the financial pressures and that relationship breakdown has had a uh, a major effect on on his well-being, um, as you know. When I talk to lots of um, men in rural communities, that's you know that is one of the things that you know has a major impact is that relationship breakdown. But one of the things that um, I can speak from personal experience, but also um, reading the case study, is that. That pressure of being a generational farmer and and the and the pressure that comes with that um, has a great toll when things start to go pear shaped um, has a great toll on your on your mental health and well being. Um, there's the you know it's probably only perceived pressure, but pressure of being a generational farmer adds a, a little bit um, more weight to it because you're holding up the family tradition and and as you um, start to you know fail, be, and most of the time that failure is coming out of outside your control. It, it, it has that impact. If you could move to the next side, slide, please. His feelings, uh, you know, are all um, would be all bottled up, um, and it, and it takes you know great skills in conversation and listening to be able to tease them out of. Um, someone particularly from the land that's um, you know fairly stoic in nature, um, those feelings of failure and anger, shame and guilt 
you know, feeling that you're you're letting your your family down, you're letting your you know your your mates down, you're letting yourself down because you know the the challenges that the drought is um, posing. Uh, feelings of frustration and hopelessness are uh, you know are really great, um, particularly you know when you um, you're trying to. Um, navigate through some fairly challenging situations. Uh, that feeling of, of of hopelessness is is uh, is real. Um, and looking uh, looking to the future, you're not able to see that clear future, and and all these things start compounding, which then adds to isolation. And in that in the case study, you see that you know Charlie is you know, starting to isolate himself from his friends, um, from his community. And, and that's, um, that also then has a, an ongoing effect on his mental health and wellbeing. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the people around him and, and, his, um, and his support network as, as Charlie's sitting there um, in that, in that doctor's clinic need to you know know the signs and understand where Charlie's coming from um, he's a he's a strong stoic man um, if he's like any of the farmers that I've met and, and opening up about his emotions and and his feelings is not something that's um, that you know blokes in general but particularly farmers don't do easily um, so opening up that conversation uh, needs to be um, done with questions that are going to let Charlie answer um, his own um, in his own way, I suppose. Uh, you know, and and that may take a little bit of teasing out because, and I can speak from my own experience and and those men that I've spoken to in rural communities, opening up that conversation is. Can be tough um, because there's that um, you know perception that it's a sign of weakness to you know to you know speak about how you're feeling, but it's not. It's actually a sign of strength, and you know, we need to keep those conversations um, you know going and not let it close up. Uh, we need to be able to listen um, to what what Charlie's got to say. He will be sitting there um, actually going to, to the doctors, um, especially with um, a non-related injury. Um, he's gone there, that's giving him his in and he probably realises now sitting there that it's a good opportunity to, to speak, but we need to listen to, those, to what he's got to say and, and support him and encourage him to be able to you know, seek help and, and tell him that, um, you know, know that there's that there's people out there to support him. There's um, there's pathways to be able to um, support him through his journey and, and help him get back on track. If you can move to the next slide, please. Well, one of the things working um, in rural and remote communities um, with people and, and particularly men like Charlie is that, you know, Communication is key. We need to be able to communicate with each other um, and that's the importance of support networks in rural communities, be able to with, talk, be able to um, you know, express your feelings and your emotions um, and, and communicate with your support network on you know, how you're feeling and then they know how they might be able to um, you know, be able to support you. It's important to stay connected, stay connected to your, um, to your community, to your support network. Um, that's, these are the things that Charlie can do to um, help himself and, and importantly, um, seek help and, and treat that help seriously. Um, you know, don't get bogged down in the day-to-day um, -day running of the farm or the, the challenges. You know, you're the most important important asset on your property and, and you need to make sure that, um, well, Charlie needs to make sure that he's looking after himself. 
Thanks, Warren. That's fabulous. And you've given us the perfect segue to Mary, the idea of the most valuable asset on the property being deeply bogged and the importance of, uh, I guess, redefining the whole attitude towards speaking up about your mental health as not being a matter of shame, but a matter of, of pride. Mary, I've seen you on video gathering men around you and talking to them very positively and very directly about this. What uh, can you tell us about your perspective on Charlie's situation from a men's health advocate point of view? Look, I think um, certainly for the uh, the impact of, of that grief and loss. So um, Warren touched or talked about this, about the generational farmer thing and, and that continuity of the family. And so when we read his case study, it, it really isn't that long since he's lost both parents in a reasonably short time. And particularly parents in a generational farm situation would be um, sort of that, that sounding board, that mentor, their friend, their confidant. So I, I think that's a really important thing to remember that even though it's, you know, in the last eight years, that's not a long time, um, particularly for anyone who's lost a parent. But so there's that grief and loss, um, there's loss of his, his marriage and, and, and his wife, I guess, and he's probably feeling um, ashamed of that in his community and his family as well. Um, the pressure that goes with all of that and he's probably feeling that that loss of faith and loss of trust and who can I turn to and um, that hopelessness of, you know, he is 69 years of age and he's potentially um, going to lose that farm. We've got the, you know, the financial pressure of drought but potentially losing that farm um, and, and that pride is, is something that we can't underestimate particularly in, in rural communities with these rural men. They are very proud people. So the pride associated with seeking help or being in financial trouble or the breakdown of a marriage, all of those things. So um, we see in the case study that he's he's got all those avoidance tactics going on. So he's avoiding catching up with people and that. But I think, um, and Warren spoke well about this, about the impact of that drought. It, it's really hard to explain, the, the, I guess, the torture and the gauntlet of emotions that come with drought and that uncertainty, the, you know, seems like it's endless and um, it's backbreaking hard work, particularly when they're feeding stock, when they knock off, they're, they're too tired and exhausted to generally want to go everywhere, which is another way we lose those connections. Um, the impact of that drought as well as either watching the stock die or sell them. So they're watching years of, of breeding and bloodlines disappear. So he probably feels like every every angle's attacking him and the financial side of it, there's possibly um, pressure from the banks, but with a, a pending divorce or potential for divorce there, there's the real possibility he's going to lose that farm. And, and again, comes back to that generational thing. You know, my family's been here for generations, yet I'm the one to lose the farm. But I think one of the, the real positives we can get out of that case study and the situation that he's in is that he is uh, help seeking. So that is is a big positive. Um, next slide, please. So I think, um, you know, there's a range of options there, but if he's going to consider that GP and go to the GP, that's that's fantastic. Um, we've got the, the family is, he's probably less likely to go to the family because um, I, I guess he's he's feeling that, that is shame and, and pride thing as well. Um, he probably doesn't want to talk too much to his children or his immediate family about it, particularly if there's a, you know, marriage issues going on there. So um, I really think in this situation that the, the GP is in, potentially in a, in a make or break situation with that presentation of a sore wrist. And while we can't ignore that sore wrist, um, I'd strongly encourage GPs to um, think of some other excuse to get him back and that gives them more time to build that trust and connection you know mate you're 69 years of age how long since you've had a full blood blood work or I don't know make something up I'm not a doctor but just something to get him back or let's you know let's get you back in a few weeks to check out the, this wrist and that, that gives that opportunity to build that trust as well um, obviously there is the do nothing option but in this situation, I think his mates are a really good strong point as well as the GP option would be probably the, the strongest two options that I see at the moment. Can we go to the next slide, please? So with the mates, I encourage them to turn up and, and don't ring him and ask, oh, mate, do you want me to come over? Just turn up, literally turn up. Because if you ring and ask him, the answer will probably be no. Um, he'll be putting up those walls and those barriers. So 
just a couple of mates get together, turn up with some steak and, and a six pack or something and, and help him finish off those chores and do some work on the farm. That shoulder to shoulder communication, so understanding that men communicate shoulder to shoulder, women communicate face to face. And I often say to men, the next time you're at an event, watch where the women are and how they communicate and watch where the men are, particularly in rural areas. The women will be sitting around a table looking at each other in the eye and communicating, whereas the men will often be standing along a fence, leaning on a vehicle and things like that. So it's that turn up, do something with him, work with him, finish that off, then sit down, light a fire, um, force him to relax, I guess. Um, so sitting around a campfire, uh, darkness is another really safe place for men to open up and, and communicate. And they can lead by example, by sharing their stories of, of what's going on for them in their life at the moment. They can just listen. And I have a lot of men who say to me, I'm not sure what to say. Well, guess what? Just just listen. But certainly if they do think he is um, in the in that space of, of thinking about taking his life, that to, to ask him that and, and really put him on the mat about that and, and ask him. So, um, yeah, sharing what's going on in their life, listening to to what he's got going on um, and that making that continual connection. So making an excuse to come back or making a pact that, look, in two weeks' time, let's go over to Bob's place and we'll do the same. And particularly in times of drought, it's very hard for people to get away from the farm and, and to have connections with other people. So um, strongly encourage that sort of thing, just that small catch up um, and again, for, for the women to, to allow the men to have that time together. One of the things that I find is really, really important is for men to have man time. They need time alone with other men um, and, and in that safe place where, where they feel comfortable to open up. And I guess um, for people interpreting the way um, rural men communicate, most of these men are visual people. So if you're trying to explain something to them, show it to them, draw a picture. These are the kind of men that we don't give them the manual to drive the tractor, we show them how to drive the tractor. So remembering that, that they're a very unique demographic in the way they learn and the way they comprehend and understand things. So that's, um, yeah, draw, draw the picture rather than, than give them the book. It's, um, yeah, I think um, that's probably, um, about it for me, obviously his mates can encourage him to get help and, um, you know, discuss options of maybe the time that they got help and things like that. So I think that's probably enough from me. That's great. Thanks, Thanks Mary. And look, both you and Warren have been getting really good rave reviews in the chat. I think people have really appreciated Warren's honesty and um, your perceptiveness, Mary, of what's going on. You've explained to me why it's so much easier to talk with a mate while you're driving somewhere together, shoulder to shoulder, uh, than yeah. sitting across a, a table. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's made an enormous amount of sense. So thank you for for that and explaining how I guess we've now got Charlie in uh, the waiting room of the, the clinic there in David's clinic. He's come in and apologised for messing up the floor, whatever it might be, and he's presented his wrist for treatment. So, uh David, how are you going to how are you going to work with um, with Charlie? We're not hearing you, David. You're muted, David. Sorry, my apologies. It Just wouldn't the, be a uh, Zoom without somebody speaking the, against the mute. So thanks for keeping things normal for us. Surely the the, the quote of the last twelve months, hasn't it? Sorry, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> so uh, look. You're hard to take up that um, tale with Mary's and Warren's insights. Um, but look, if I, when I approached the case, I, I really tried to, to give perspective. I really tried to imagine myself sitting in my office and seeing him for the first time. And I put, don't ignore the risk pain with an asterisk there for a reason, because, and I think Mary touched on this, is that, that that's why he came. I think you have to really respect the fact and, and that that's why he turned up. But don't feel you have to launch into, you know, being the risk pain, solving the risk pain. You've got time to actually ask a little bit more about it, get a little bit more context, talk to him about why he's ended up there. Um, and, and I think reflecting on on practices that, um, as a general practitioner, rapport is the is the it's the foundation stone of everything we do. Um, but you don't have to get it 
in an instant. Um, and you may be challenged with, um, with learning the language. You may not know much about what he does. You may not understand his, his enterprise, his farming. So take the time. Uh, for me, it's one of the, the absolute joys of general practice is actually talking to people about their, their, their jobs, finding out what they do, ask about words you don't understand, and just take the chance to actually get to know him a bit because it's probably, you know, presuming it's the first time you've met him. But don't forget his wrist. So come back to his wrist and acknowledge the fact that's why he came and come up with a plan to how you're going to further explore it. And then next time you see him, you'll have some more to, to work with. Um, next slide, please. And I guess this slide kind of builds on that. It's that, again, the luxury of us in general practice is that, is that we don't have to solve everything in a day. We're not an emergency department. But if you don't get that rapport, he won't come back. Um, and likewise, um, you, you get the, whilst you get the luxury to chip away at things and to kind of have reasons to get him back and to work on um, holistic aspects of his care, you, you also can't, you can't miss the risk if it's staring you in the face. So you need to take the chance to actually really um, just inquire about that risk to acknowledge it. And I'll touch on a bit more in the next few slides, but um, come up with a plan as to how you're going to approach um, both his wrist, but also his kind of wider um, mental health issues as you're starting to acknowledge them from here on in. Next slide, thanks. So again, Mary and Warren really touched on these um, and, you know, I think hopefully we all pick them up in the case is that there's a lot of things here that stare at you from a background point of view. And then there's some things that I'll touch on the next slide that are more kind of acute things that have popped up in the more recent term. You know, he's, he's in his mid, he's a, a middle-aged male. He's had a separation. He's really drawing away from his family supports. He's isolated. He's got the classical succession planning challenges. And, and I think that that concept of a generational farmer is, is a beautiful one and really one that is hard to describe until you hear people like him talk about um, how it impacts him. Um, he's got the impact of the drought. And again, uh, I'm, I'm presuming, you know, this concept of being asset rich, he's got a property that's probably worth millions of dollars, but may not necessarily have much cash in the bank to even buy the, the essentials he needs for day to day. So that concept of being asset rich and cash poor. Um, drought and stock losses. And again, I think both Mary and Warren really touched on it. it, it I remember talking to a patient once about about losing cattle in a flood, and it was really touching to me to realise that despite it being a business, his stock meant everything to him. And you know, he was he was so emotionally attached to the stock. It was really um really moving to actually hear him talk about them. So I think I think being very wary of um, when people tell you that they've lost stock because it's usually very emotionally telling. Um, and also acknowledging that he almost certainly has firearms. I'd be enormously surprised if he doesn't. Next slide, thanks. And again, I guess more kind of um, acute things, things that have popped up more recently is that he's increasing his alcohol. Um, he is, and I guess, exploring how much and what that means to him and how long that's been going on. He's not doing the things that he actually finds fun. And, and I think one of the commonest questions I ask people is, what do you actually do for fun? And it, more often than not, um, people in his situation stare at me and go, well, I haven't, I used to do this and this, but I haven't done that for many years. And, and exploring why and how that came to pass is actually often quite enlightening in itself. Um, he's socially withdrawn, as we touched on. And again, as I alluded to, it's really important at this point to, to think about um, whether he's actually suicidal. So is he starting to get thoughts? Are they fleeting? How quickly can he, can he deal with them? What are, his, um, what are the tools and strategy he, he uses to get rid of them? Is it alcohol? Is it distraction? Um, or are they becoming really quite pervasive? Are they actually interfering with his, his ability to do his day-to-day -day things? So they're certainly the things that I... Um, that, occurred to me when I was considering his case and I, I really um, I'm really interested to see and the questions that you might throw up from the floor. Thanks David look I might toss one in immediately before we go on to Tim only because it's uh, come up a couple of times in the various chats which is about involving other therapists in a way the use of the the wrist injury may be involving uh, people have been mentioning a physiotherapist or a occupational therapist with, you know, splints or um, tap turners or something like that. 
but maybe there are other mental health or other health professionals who might have a different um, uh, appointment system who'd be able to spend a bit more time chatting while they work on the focused task of manipulating the wrist or teaching exercises or something. Is that something that you can do there in Longridge? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, again, one of the joys of being in a country town is you get some networks that you can uh, rely on. And actually, interestingly, um, one of our most kind of trusted people within our network was our actually our pharmacist. And the pharmacist would seemingly have this ability to tap into people coming for medication to kind of, especially people that had already, um, you know, been diagnosed with something and they would, she would help monitor their mental state and really keep track of how they were traveling. And um, we developed a quite a, um, a quite a close feedback method to, to kind of keep track of people who, who might not be doing quite so well. Sure. All right. And look, there's a few other people are asking about ETOH, which is uh, shorthand for alcohol. It's a great way of writing that you're concerned about somebody's alcohol consumption without them knowing that that's what you're saying, but it's the um, organic chemistry uh, formula for alcohol. So that's what that's about. And also the suicidal issues and the access to firearms. And uh, Mary will expand on some of her approaches uh, to that um, in the in the Q&A. But, uh, you know, obviously resources are limited uh, in most places of Australia, but a, a territory as challenging as um, Western Queensland has to be particularly challenging. Now, Tim Driscoll, let's say that uh, David has referred uh, Charlie to you or um, somebody like Charlie you would have dealt with. I think of, we've got over a thousand people online at the moment and they've all met people like Charlie, I'm sure. Let's have your perspective on the case of Charlie. Sure. I, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything new in terms of, uh, you know, the things that I've noticed that have been a cause of concern. I think they're very consistent across people. Um, but obviously we've got him being isolated and alone um, through bereavement from his parents, uh, separation from his wife, um, also some geographical distance from family, uh, other members of the family as well. So he is very isolated in that way and he's also not interacting with people in town too much. He's very much keeping to himself. Uh, financially stressed through the drought um, and more generally he's drinking more uh, and he's injured in, and in pain. Um, so I don't really want to spend a huge amount of time on this slide other than there's a basic snapshot there that um, there's a few things that jump out immediately. So what, what does um, sort of identify itself as being a little bit more unique to the situation really um, is that we've got three generations um, on the line. So we've got a property that's been in that family for three generations. And, and what that can mean is that a lot more identity is tied to that role um, as a producer in that area. Um, and also the history of that person is very, very much tied in with the family. So it's very uncommon that uh, most businesses um, obviously have three generations, as you see in agriculture, but it's also not so common that your home is also your business. Um, so those things are tied up together in, in agriculture much closer than they are anywhere else. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, considering the future here is that um, it doesn't really seem clear that there is succession here, that there is a plan going forward for the property, that this is going to continue. Um, he certainly sounds like he's sort of on his own in this situation. And the other thing is obviously what we're looking at is there's a potential loss of a way of life. Um, and and that, that's particularly concerning. We've got someone in an age bracket which is he's, he's got a very um, strong set of skills in a particular area and that's not necessarily transferable depending on what his financial situation and his age. You put those two together. Uh, and it means you've got someone that's had a, a very strong role in a community um, potentially finding it more difficult to get to get work. So the, there's a the huge issue there in terms of just the financial side as well. If if he was to come off the land, obviously if if, if you know just selling the property was not necessarily an option at that point, um, or it might take some time. That's the other thing. While the, the property might be worth money, doesn't mean that someone's necessarily going to buy it anytime soon. So it, it is a real um, problem in that, that way. And also at the end of that, what I've said is. Um, you know, it's a way of life on the line, but obviously life itself as well in terms of we've got someone in a very risky situation here um, in terms of just the basic demographics. We've got a rural male who's very isolated. Um, some of those signs are suggestive of depression. Uh, and the other problem about here, we, we mentioned firearms, which is a, which is a big issue, obviously, um, but also, also time and space and opportunity to, to spiral down. So if you've got someone that's by themselves um, and... 
um, you know, have that, that time and space where if they do end up in a spiral, and he's got quite a few different areas that could end up spiraling for him down, is that there's nothing in to, to interrupt that. So whether it's a firearm or, or other methods, if suicidal thoughts are there, um, you know, it is very, very scary. And it's, it's scary for this age group and older. And um, often we don't, we don't necessarily identify that. But, um, you know, older men are at, at huge risk um, in that category, and, and particularly when they're isolated like this gentleman is. So I'd be very concerned in this situation. Uh, so we'll, we'll just move on to the, the next slide. Um, so one of the, the key things to think about here, I think, is that, um, you know, our main concern is not that therapy doesn't work. Our main concern here is that we're going to have a real hard time keeping this guy on the line in terms of actually coming in and, and continuing the therapy. Actually, the most likely uh, thing is that he will not either present or he might come once and, and then and then not continue. So that, that's actually our main issue in, in this situation in terms of providing therapy from a psychologist's point of view, is that this guy is actually going to be really, really difficult to continue to engage. And that's going to be our biggest challenge. Um, and some of those barriers are obviously we've got someone who's you know, very proud and very independent, um, very, very good approaches to life, generally. Um, you know, that, that's a great approach to life until it stops working. So if you've been really, really self-reliant, and then it's not working anymore and you're not used to getting help from other people. It's a dangerous situation. So a great approach usually, but when it stops working, it's a real concern. Um, it's very likely that you know, he won't want to talk, particularly in a, you know, a therapy environment. If you imagine what Mary was mentioning at all, if you imagine what a classic therapy room looks like, face-to-face -face across a room, maybe with a, a couple of chairs in a room. So it's certainly not shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder often. So um, that, that can absolutely be more, more confronting, a very unnatural environment. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is he's coming about his wrist. He's not talking about um, what's going on in his head. He's talking about pain in his wrist, and we certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be ignoring that. Um, that's what he's come to the, the doctor with. Um, and, and I think another thing that's useful in terms of just thinking about how we might approach this is that um, I mean, it's a bit of a sort of cliche here in terms of men have problems and women have feelings. But what I mean by that is, if you want to keep a man involved in therapy, you have to look at from a look at it from a problem focused point of view. So, you know, you you want to get to a solution. That's the focus. And I know it's a generalisation to say that, but women are much more emotionally literate, much more willing to talk about their feelings. Men want to find a solution to the problem they're in. That's, the, that's generally the way it goes. So if we're looking at keeping this person involved in therapy, we're going to make sure that we've got some sort of a problem focus here in terms of how am I going to deal with this situation. It's, it's quite unlikely that it's going to be so feelings focused for the man. Um, now, the, the idea with women get sick and men die, now this is from general medicine. Um, you know, women go to the doctor, men don't. Um, and that's really what that's what's that talking about is, is, is men wait to get much, much sicker before they get help with their physical health often, particularly in rural areas. Uh, you know, it's probably stronger with mental health. So um, one of those things is that um, men wait much longer and that's really exaggerated in rural areas. So that's important to remember as well is that we often necessarily won't see a person until things have got a lot worse. Um, and I think another key thing is that if we imagine uh, mental health clinicians generally or psychologists or you know or various other mental health professionals that do go into these areas many of them aren't from a rural background it's actually quite uncommon that people are from a rural background so the other thing is that what does that psychologist or mental health clinician know about life on the land can they relate to, to me can they understand where i'm coming from uh, and that, that that can be a big issue so it's important that people obviously know a little bit about the area that they're going into um, because if you're going to build rapport you need to have some understanding of that person's life um, and understand what they're actually, you know, telling you. Um, so we'll just move on to the next slide. Um, so looking at all those barriers, I, I guess the other thing we need to look at is we've got someone that might be very difficult to engage with for a psychologist, absolutely. Um, so what are our cards? What, what's our way to get through here? Well, our, our first card to consider is a GP. Now, a GP has absolutely got a lot more um, respect, or well, you could say street cred, than a psychologist. Psychologists generally they might be more concerned about how much they're going to be able to help. Very, very rare that someone would go, I oh, know a GP uh, just couldn't help anyone anytime. But you hear that about psychology, um, you know, frequently enough. So a GP is certainly someone that, you know, is respected and accepted that, um, you know, this is someone that can, you know, help in many situations. So if we've got the GP selling that service in terms of, you know, referring on, so we've got that person selling the service, very important to us. Uh, so in the clinic that we're talking about, um, we'd be looking at RFDS flying in, so the GP would be one of our GPs. Uh, the other thing is we've got our nursing staff. Now, 
the nursing staff are going to have an additional benefit as well in terms of they're the people that go into the community more often. So the GPs move more often. So there's a greater um, change over in the GPs, whereas the nurses actually live in the in Charleville or Mount Isa generally. Um, so they're more regularly at those clinics. So they've got the personal connection. And so do the community nurses in terms of the, the nurses stationed in those towns. Um, so they've got a personal connection. Um, the other one is that using the, even the pilot. So the pilot is often male, uh, often a person that people are very interested in talking to, uh, and often also a familiar face because they were also living in the community and they've been more often that the people at those clinics more frequently. So they've got the connection, but they're also someone that, that men are more interested in talking to as well. So if we've got them on side to, to promote mental health, that's a, a fantastic opportunity as well. Um, and really right after that, it's sort of psychologist after that. So we need everyone else to basically sell us before we might be able to get a foot in the door. Um, and essentially, um, you know, the, the, the key thing there is that we do actually pay some attention to the person we're talking to, realising that, you know, dropout's very likely, but also making sure that we have some understanding of what that person's going through in that context, so getting some understanding. The other thing is, is have we got time? And really, the people that can set that up for us are the GP and the nurses in terms of bringing him back. Um, so that's the other thing, because the other thing is he's unlikely necessarily to come back for another psychology appointment, but he might hang around if he's going to get a blood test or another check on that wrist. So that's how we can get a bit more time. Um, and just moving on to the next slide. Um, and I, I really think this is just something useful to think about this ca in, in this case. And, and as a sort of generalisation to you know, producers in general is that so pushing forward is you know, a really resilient approach, but sometimes what it can mean is that we're digging a deeper hole. So if we're continuing to do the same thing and it's not working, it's not really resilience, it's false resilience. Because what we're doing is we're ending deeper in the hole. So when we need to think about resilience, we need to talk more about it in terms of adaption, uh, particularly in terms of how things have changed, you know, this area, particularly drought. So we've already seen um, you know, huge financial pressures if we continue to do the same thing, and it's, it's not that we've got no control over the drought, but if we just had someone going, that's resilient, he just pushes and pushes and pushes, it's not really resilience. It's actually you know, falling into a deeper hole. So if we keep doing something that's not working, even though it's worked for three generations, if it's not working in the current context, it's, you know, it's no longer resilience. And um, I think we really need to think about adaption as part of resilience, because if we give people the idea that you just need to push and push and push, eventually the wire breaks. Um, you know, that everyone has their limit. Um, and I, I think that can be a, a problematic message sometimes if we think about resilience as just keeping on going. Uh, we have to think about it as, as adaption. We have to think about you know, making sure that our well-being is part of that in terms of going into the future. So pushing no matter what's not always an ideal scenario. It works a lot of the time, but when it doesn't, um, you know, it, it, it's a bigger problem. And that's, I think that's it for me. Thanks, Tim. You've really pulled it together well, and I think there's such a great parallel there between your analogy of pushing and pushing and getting deeper and Mary's analogy about revving it into the red and just spinning your wheels deeper into the bog. Um, those are the sorts of um, visuals and realities that uh, men do seem to respond to, as a few people have said. And I think, uh, you know, your comment about you know, men having problems and women having feelings. I think Mary also says about, uh, you know, men dealing in facts rather than feelings. So that's what you talk to them with. A few questions have popped up and bringing a few of them together, it's actually, well, two things. One is the other people in the rural community who could be recruited. But Tim, you mentioned the pilot, people have been mentioning bush chaplains, pharmacists, uh, people who might not be immediately visible as mental health professionals and might not carry some of the suspicion that I believe mental health professionals can carry. Tim, I see you smiling. Mary, you're smiling. Uh, is that something that there is a bit of suspicion about mental health professionals or reserve that maybe other people don't carry? Oh, definitely. Um, I, I think, and there's a few reasons for it, is that, um, you know, mental health clinicians are generally urban people. Um, so if you think about, you know, for a primary health nurse, for example, it's much more common to see someone that might have grown up in a rural area, but it's very uncommon for someone to come off the property and then go, oh, I think I'm going to go away from cattle and become a psychologist. It's sort of, um, it is rare in that way. So you, you will get those experiences of just sort of people going in to see a mental health clinician and they're just sort of going, they just didn't have any idea what I was talking about. So there is that sort of direct yeah. experience. 
Um, but also, I mean, the, the other thing that's really important is that look, most mental health support doesn't actually come from mental health clinicians. It comes from you know, family, friends, community members. That's where most of it comes from. Um, I think yeah. we, you know, we're really, that's really important to remember. And people have certainly touched on that as well. Um, confidentiality uh, has come up as well. What are people's thoughts on what happens if, I mean, is the pilot bound by the same confidentiality that binds other mental health professionals? Does it matter? I mean, can um, we so can people talk without breaching privacy? Yeah, I mean, really, what we're looking at is for the for the pilot to talk up the idea of, of seeing a therapist. Um, so, in terms of confidentiality, um, I mean, I, I think there's general human decency that comes in there. Obviously, there's not you know a binding you know code of conduct in terms of you know keeping that confidential. But um, I mean, I think what we're looking at is just a basic human decency, really there. Yeah, that's a hot topic this week about basically being a decent person. So that's clearly what is being reflected here that, you know, it, you don't have to be trained in these things, uh, that uh, if your heart's in the right place and people see you as a, an honest, straight down the line character, that can carry a lot. And I think that's what Mary and Warren have also mentioned. But I'm really struck by one of the images that has come up in the chat in several postings about the risk of suicide, the image of the farmer dispatching his stock with a rifle and thinking, you know, I'm ending suffering. What about me? Mary, you were going to talk to us a bit more about access to firearms. Yes, I think um, the firearms or the, the ownership of firearms is a massive blockage to, to seeking help and particularly going to um, mental health professionals because um, I don't know if it's one of the standard questions that they ask, but I have so many men say to me, I'm not going to go and talk to someone because they'll take my guns off me. Um, now, this is not just for, for primary producers or, or gun owners. Um, I've also spoken with, um, you know, police and, and detectives and the first you know as soon as they present and say look I've got some mental health issues the first thing they do is take their gun off them now the bottom line is particularly to rural men um, taking their guns off them is um, it's an insult to their intelligence if you think that's the only way they're going to do it so um, I don't know what the requirements are for for the medical profession and, and doctors and psychologists if they do have to ask that question and if they are required to notify I don't know but um, I know it is it is a big blockage that these men think that that's going to be the first course of action and the cops are going to turn up and take their guns off them and, they, and so they won't go and get help because of that just because they don't want to lose that. And it's it's not that they necessarily want to hang on to the gun to actually use it on themselves, but some of these men have generational collectible firearms, you know, a, a firearm that their grandfather used in the war and they don't want to lose that and they would rather suffer then lose that treasure. So yeah, that's that's one of the blockages I see. Thanks for that very serious issue. Also, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the uh, physicality of communicating with men and how that might differ from women. Um, and the setup of the room now, uh, Tim, you touched on this, but David, I'm curious, your general practice consulting room, do you consult across the desk or around? David, are you with us? I think you might have frozen. Yeah, I, thought, I was. I was blaming you, Steve, for freezing. But uh, one of us froze. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I caught the question just to just to clarify if I've got it correct. Um, just to, with the setup of the room and whether yeah. it's a kind of a, a really traditional over the desk thing or not. Is that how you? you That's pretty it? much it. I mean, uh, GPs the way the GP sets up their room, the way they set up their appointment schedule, often communicates, I guess, about how available they are or how available their patients want them to be what's your preferred consulting setup yeah so I, I i consult over the corner of my desk if that makes sense so i actually kind of um so i've got the computers on my desk facing me and then i have the patient sitting to my side so we kind of sit at 45 degrees and during the consult especially if i know that it's primarily about mental health i just i really try to avoid the temptation to touch my computer it just it just if you just take the time to look at the patient and listen and just you will catch up on your notes, you will get there, you'll get a chance to write them. I just think it is uh, it, it is incredibly distracting for the patient 
to just be typing notes. Coupled with that, I can't type. So when I type, it's just a, it's a, a flurry of activity as I try to um, hunt and peck, I think is the correct name for my typing style, where I hunt for the keys and then peck at them like a chicken. So for me, it's much better to actually take the time to sit and talk to the patient, and then I will catch up with the notes. Yeah, look, I think it's really important. There's actually a whole body of literature that talks about the shared space of the desk and what is the man's, what is the, the doctor's, and uh, what's termed the keyboard shove, the power of just pushing the keyboard away and really attending to the man and saying, you know, I'm really here for you. We'll deal with your wrist, but however much time you need uh, is a really important message, but um, difficult in the way general practice is structured. And a number of people have identified other people in the community who might be able to uh, support like social workers, mental health um, social workers. Um, the Rural Fire Service, SES, other groups do have um, uh, counsellors and uh, supports who can be helpful if the, the man happens to be involved in that. But a number of questions have also come up about gender, and obviously this is about men's health. I'm just wondering what the panel thinks about the different approach. We've talked about a few things to do with the physicality, the interaction. We've talked about the focus on uh, facts rather than feelings and things like that. Are there any other issues people wanted to mention about what makes relating to men, particularly in this situation, rural men, different to what might occur in the city? or with women, I should say. Um, yeah, I'll have a crack at that one, Steve, if you like. Go for it, Mary. Um, I think it is it is very much about understanding that shoulder to shoulder um, for men versus face to face. And when we ask men about things, you know, or, or how, they're, how things are going for them, I think we need to be able to interpret that man speak in so much as if we ask a, a woman how her week's been, she will go to the emotions. So, you know, I've been stressed, I've been tired, I've been happy, I've been sad, whatever it is. But if you ask a, a bloke and particularly a country bloke of how's your week been? Well, you know, the fence fell down and the bull got out and the dog ran away. Like, it's about the facts. And so from what he's telling us in the facts, we can glean the emotion, we will get to the emotion, but we have to let those facts come out and we can expand on those as, as well, I guess. And um, yeah, and I think the, the room set up that, that David was talking about and you asked before was is quite important. Um, I, I know that when men come to talk to me and, and want to express something or, or tell me something that they need to get off their chest, they will come over and look me in the eye and shake my hand, but they will immediately turn to the side and, and fold their arms and either look into the distance or look at the ground. And so that's where, you know, potentially if we have a man like that, it, it's possibly better for the clinician or the, the medical professional to be to look away at something. I mean, pretend you're writing notes on a piece of paper or something. I mean, you can scribble. That's what doctors do anyway, isn't it? So it's... Um, yeah, because staring them in the eye is, is often the, the worst way to get these men, or the, the best way to get these men to shut down. Um, and I know when people talk to me, or men talk to me in particular, it, it is my natural instinct to want to turn and look at them in the eye, but um, I've become quite accustomed to yeah, stand shoulder to shoulder and, yeah, just fold your arms and look off in the distance or, or whatever. So it's being able to interpret that man speak. Um, Whereas if you weren't looking at a woman, she'd probably think you weren't interested or you weren't listening. Mm. But often looking away from the man is the best way to get him to open up. I have heard people talk about the power of eye contact and how you can really regulate the interaction by making eye contact when it's important and then detaching to give people. I mean, you don't want to be too stylized about it, I wouldn't have yeah. thought, but it's, there's a rhythm to the conversation where when you're really making an important point, you know, like if you're going to ask them about suicide risk, I guess you have to make some eye contact to show it's important, but then yep. disengage, not disengage, but just pull back a bit so that they can talk freely and maybe yeah. kick a bit of dust around. What I think the other thing others? is very important is um, personal space as well. Certainly the further we get into rural areas, the bigger the personal space. So, you know, city people are much more comfortable having a conversation closer together. But, you know, once we start going to, to Cloncurry or Julia Creek, you know, six or seven feet apart is quite okay and normal. So, yeah. Hmm. Absolutely. Other people's reflections on that? What about you, Warren? What are your feelings and the men you speak with? How do they feel about uh, the trust for mental health professionals, who they can talk to, how they like to be engaged with? 
I think, um, yeah, it's understanding, like Mary said, that that communication is probably a cliche to say that men don't communicate, but we probably do, and it's just in a different way. And um, and it's understanding, you know, those key things. And I think it comes back to I think either I think um, either David or Tim said about really understanding a bit of the background of maybe the area that you're working in or, you know, some of the challenges that they that they may face. It's something that's really a, an important thing that I do if I go into a community is to try and understand what are the challenges of that, that community is facing. Um, generally, you know, it doesn't matter where you go in Australia, there'll be probably three similar ones in every community, um, but then there'll be, you know, regional or community-based um, issues that are that are challenging people. So it's under understanding the area, but then understanding um, how the male or the farmer communicates, uh, you know, with you and some of those things like, like Mary, um, I think, alluded to, like, you know, just understanding, like, we, you know, the fences, you know, these com um, compounding issues like, you know, the fence fell down, the, the bull got out, you know, the ute broke down, you know, the tractors bogged in the paddock and all these things are just an accumulative build-up that um, we're all, he's all adding to the stress and adding to the, you know, I suppose the, the eventuality of the, the person presenting at a, at a clinic. Sure. Now, and Charlie's on his own, his relationship's broken down, his kids don't see him much anymore, but a question's been asked by Melissa Duncan about the um, people's partners, men's partners, and whether they, or what role they play, I guess, in encouraging uh, their partner to seek help, or uh, I, I know it's generalising, but how do men in Charlie's situation, but who do have a partner with them how do they generally respond to being encouraged to seek help by their their life partner and i have a shot at that one <laughs> yeah sure warren and then and then tim yeah yeah um just that like that is hard particularly in a situation that charlie finds himself uh, if his if his wife was still with him is that you know you're both going through the same situation um, the droughts having the same impact on on you and uh, being able to um, you know lean on on your partner um, or vice versa is really hard because you know I know from personal experience that you know I knew that my wife was going through the same as me I was just dealing with the challenges um, differently to her and, and and adding the pressure of me um, you know, letting her know that I wasn't traveling really well was something that I didn't want to do. But I know that in that case that, you know, someone that's just there reassuring you that they're there. Um, so in Charlie's case, this is one really major factor that, you know, that's a real you know, alert for me is that he's had a, a relationship breakdown. So he hasn't got that person there to, to you know, to lean on or, you know, or for them to reassure him that, you know, he's, he's okay and that he's got support close by. So that's a real, a, a big, you know, alarm bell for me, especially in this case study there where um, Charlie has now had a relationship breakdown. He hasn't got that person there um, with him, which I know is vitally important to me eventually seeking help. Great. Thanks for that. Tim, what about your thoughts? Well, I think it's one of the most common reasons that men get help at all. It's their, their partners drive that. Um, but on the other other side of that, we have to be really careful that um, we don't end up in a situation where it's got to the point where someone's been dragged there. Um, and what happens in that situation is that you'll you'll get a man, he'll come into the room, he'll fold his arms, and basically what's going on in his head is that I knew it was going to be rubbish and it's even worse than I thought it was going to be. I don't want to be here. Um, and it's just as crap as I thought it was going to be. So, um, you know, they are they're absolutely women are the, the drivers of men ending up in therapy particularly. Um, but you have to be pretty delicate in the way that that's handled in terms of if someone's pushed in there, um, not only is it the appointment a waste of time, it also makes it much, much harder the next time to try and get them in when men might need it even more. So um, it's absolutely the way that they get in there. But if we push too hard, it can become really counterproductive. Um, yeah. So it has to be handled fairly delicately. 
Look, that's been a clear message from this evening, hasn't it, that it's all about people being supportive of the man seeking the help he needs or it's just not going to happen. You can have your mental health care plan and your psychologist sessions all set up, but getting him there and getting him to participate rather than just sitting there uh, is going to be really important. So, so much of what you've talked about tonight has been about preparing for people to make best use of that, um, that opportunity. Um, I'm just thinking about other things that have come up. There's uh, the idea of telehealth. Now, we've been pushed into telehealth uh, through the pandemic, but um, does the remoteness of a, a video consultation assist with men uh, in the sort of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder type concept, or is it more confronting? Uh, Tim or David, you've probably shifted a fair part of your practices online uh, through the pandemic. Uh, how's it gone with men? Um, I might kick off, Tim, if you're happy. Um, yeah, look, I, I think, um, look, again, it's a really hard one to generalise. I've got some patients who, some men who do really well on telehealth. And um, I, I think in general, I would say that once you've had some initial face-to-face -face consultations, it's, it's, I, it's easy enough to continue. I, it certainly is one of the things that can be, that can be hard over telehealth, I, I, I personally think. Um, I think it can be difficult at times to draw things out of people. Video helps, um, but again, that's got its challenges with regards to bandwidth and making sure you've got enough um, enough connection. I've had a, an unfortunate situation in the past, and anecdotes aren't everything, obviously, but where the connection became so poor that it just became incredibly frustrating for the patient. He was trying to relay something that was really important to him and, and the lack of um, connectivity actually just um, really soured the whole experience. So, look, I've had mixed, mixed um, experiences, to be honest. Tim, yourself? Yeah, look, I think Tim, I think you're demonstrating the problem. Uh, that... just the same amount of things. Um... <laughs> Sorry, Tim, I think you're demonstrating the problem that David was referring to with the technology. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. That was someone's in a, a situation. Hold on. <laughs> Can, yeah, can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, no, that's good. We were talking about demonstrating things rather than talking about them. You've done a fantastic job there of some of the problems. Sure. Was so it similar to what David really... said about for some people it's great, for others it's not? So choice is important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think the other thing is that, you know, telephone is still a large part of that as well. Um, you know, we, we're talking about, um, you know, video conferencing a lot, but a lot is still done on, on telephone um, in terms of people we've met before. Um, and many people still prefer that. So most men in terms of, um, you know, more remote clients, if they're doing sessions, they'd prefer to do it over a mobile phone than over video conference. Um, and I, I think that, you know, video does help in terms of, you know, that assessment phase in terms of, you know, seeing how the person's interacting and, and you lose a lot of that, whether it's video or phone. Obviously, you've got tone of voice, which can help. But if you freeze, like I was just doing on a video conference, it gets really, really difficult to, to keep the person involved, um, particularly if you're discussing something that's got a, a lot of emotion attached to it because people get very frustrated very easily in that situation. So it is a bar barrier in that, in that regard. Yeah, so you need the technology to be invisibly in the background rather than taking all the all the attention. Absolutely. Look, it's time for us, I mean, go or not, to be honest, but it's time for us to wrap up. I'm just interested if each person could give us in a couple of minutes just a final comment, what, what you would say to Charlie when he first approached you and said, you know, what can you do to help me? What would you, what would you say, Warren? Uh, I think um, if Charlie approached me, to, it's just opening up, building that rapport and opening up that conversation with him and, and, and listening and supporting him and, and, and not being judgmental to his situation, um, understanding that, you know, 
the challenges that he's facing and, and having empathy for those, even if, if you've never been through something like that before. Um, for me, you know, the relationship breakdown with his wife is something that I haven't experienced, but I could empathise the loss and the grief that he would be feeling um, and, and encourage him to keep that conversation going and and whether that's with with me or his support network um understanding that he, he really needs to understand that you know there's people that, that are, are around him that love and 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 want to support him and he needs to let them in and then obviously then ongoing once that rapport is built is then encouraging him to seek help from a professional person to um you know to help him you know, get back on the road to recovery Great, thanks, Warren. Mary, there's in the chat, there's a, a poem that's really caught my eye from Ken. It's dry all right, said young O'Neill, with which astute remark, he squatted down upon his heel and chewed a piece of bark, which pretty much captures the, the male uh, country psyche, I guess. So O'Neill has come up to you at one of your sessions and said, you know, I need some help. What what can you do? Yeah, I think that's um, that's part, you know, as as Warren said, is is empathising with them, but um, it's it's sitting into that into that hole with them, I guess, and and giving them the space and the silence to do that, um, and, and particularly with um, with women trying to help their partners, I, I find a lot of women sit them at the table and and stare them in the eye and he's and tell me he won't talk to me, and I'm like you're doing it all wrong. Um, and the men often won't share with their partners because they don't want to burden them, as as Warren said. But I think, um, yeah, if Charlie came up to me, I'd be um, in encouraging him to, to offload that and to empty the bucket, as I call it, get that stuff out, um, sit into that foxhole with him and, and listen to what he's got to say and, um, you know, directing him to the appropriate services and I guess really using all the analogies that I talk about with the emptying the bucket and you're only bogged, mate, we don't need to burn this vehicle, we can get you out of this. Um, and, and yeah, it, you are the most valuable asset on on your property. And um, you know, look, it doesn't matter how big the machine is or how heavy it is, we can get it out. Um, and I often talk about driving in the dark that we we can head down the road. Um, and I think when we're in a good headspace, we're, we're confident that we can get from one town to the next, but we can't see the whole road and we can't see the next town when we turn the lights on. But when we get bogged we tend to forget that there's a road there and we forget the next town is there. So it's a bit like driving at night. I tell them that it's, you know, you just, if we keep going down the road, we'll see a little bit more at a time, but that's where our friends, our family and um, the professionals are there to light up a bit more road for us and to remind us that the road is there. So yeah, um, I'm a big advocate for sit, sit into the foxhole with him and, and have a listen. So. So that's great, Mary. And I think you've you've hit upon a really important point there about the the sympathy of a friend sharing the experience, the empathy of somebody who can see the problem and that the person under, knows they've been understood, and then moving, I guess, to the compassion of the health professional and the concerned friend actually doing something to help. So, David, your two minute summary about what you see as being the key points here. Look, I think along similar lines, I think it's about um, acknowledging that he's come and, and you know, thanking him for come and, and coming up with uh, coming up with a plan to address his risks and why he's actually been there. But, but thinking of the long game, our job is to really engage him to make sure he um, that we take the time to get to know him and to to deal with some of these things in the more longer term. So I, I wouldn't let him kind of as a key takeaway he wouldn't be leaving my surgery without an appointment to come back and see me, ideally at a time that suits him um, with a plan in place of the things I would like him to do beforehand, whether that's something simple like an x-ray for his wrist, but a plan to come back and then I'll be taking up the conversation again. But it's really just take the time. This is, sure. a, this is a long game in most, of, most cases. And then connect him into the other services once that rapport has been established. I mean, it is that... A lot of our audience are too young to remember fax machines, but you've got to make that connection, that handshake, and actually get things connected so that people can then uh, communicate what needs to be communicated. So, Tim, your couple of minutes um, last statement before we finish up. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, finding out where he's coming from is also, you know, really, really important in terms of working out from his perspective what's happening, obviously, as a starting point for, for therapy. Um, but one of the other things that'll be really key here is, you know, not, not appearing too strange myself in that way in terms of, you know, making sure that that's a, a comfortable, more normal feeling conversation. Um, because I, I think that can be an issue when, when people do seem to therapist in terms of having a more natural feeling conversation be one of the things that I'd be really um, keen on. I mean, I, I don't tend to have a specific approach when I'm talking to someone um, in terms of, you know, that assess, but I really follow where they take me because I just find that, uh, is a much more smoother way of getting additional information. If you follow where they're going, you understand them better uh, and it just flows better and you, and you get everything you need uh, and the person has a better experience of it. Um, but really a lot of it is really about making it seem more natural. Um, you know, it could seem like a very foreign experience first time going into, into therapy. So making that feel as natural and comfortable as possible. Uh, being upfront in terms of, you know, what we can, what we can provide. Um, um, but really just making sure that it feels like a normal, natural conversation. Sure. Look, great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I must say, if uh, Mary or Warren, if you're ever thinking of standing for Parliament, I don't care which party, I'd vote for you both. <laughs> You've just been absolutely fabulous tonight. Please don't leave us, everybody. Uh, there's a few things just to finish off on. Um, there's an exit survey, and if you could give us feedback, please do that. There's a pie chart type icon in the lower right corner of your screen beside that speech bubble. So please fill out the survey or just hang on, uh, and a message will pop up inviting you to do so when the webcast ends. You will receive an email from MHPN that has the details of the recording. A few people have asked about the recording, so you will get a link to that, and please do pass it on to colleagues or, or friends um, who might be interested in what's been discussed tonight, because there's been a lot of really important things that we've um, covered tonight. Um, tomorrow night, upcoming activity. It's the second in a series of culturally and linguistically diverse webinars. And the ones, this one's about an interdisciplinary conversation, exploring the meaning of healing and recovery and what that means to different people. 7th of April, there's an Emerging Minds Challenging Communications with Children session. 15th of April, um, MHPN Coping with Life Transitions in Young Adults. Uh, and then new episodes of uh, MHPN's podcast series, Trauma and Resilience series, Resilience we've spoken about tonight, they're now available on Apple, Spotify, or directly on uh, MHPN's website. So there you go. Uh, if you would like to join discussions with other professionals at your local level, then there are project officers who are available to help you establish uh, or join an existing MHPN network, and that's across metropolitan, regional, rural, and remote Australia. There are 373 networks around the country, so please visit the online map on the website and see what's close to you, or contact Jackie, whose uh, email address will be on the website. Um, and you can also go to the map by following the link that will pop up once you complete the survey. So time for us to finish. We're a couple of minutes over, but uh, I'm not going to apologise for that because I think there's been so much good content from each of our four speakers tonight. Thank you all very much indeed. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of um, other people and carers of those who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So please, everybody, keep an eye on your shitometers, keep it in the green, um, and don't get bogged. Um, be careful with each other, be careful with yourselves. We wish you all very well. Thank you to the panel again, and thank you all for participating. Have a great evening and a great break coming up if you can get one. Goodbye. <laughs>